What is real? You ever wonder, you ever ask yourself that question? How does what is real impact our choices, our attitude, and our actions? How about our joy? Does our perception of reality impact our life experiences? I would say so, and I'm going to take you through something here the next few minutes that I feel like God's put on my heart over the last few weeks and um, hopefully encourage you with it. Let me just take you back to my childhood briefly and ask you this and take you back to your childhood. What is the purpose of school? And most of us would probably answer, to learn. But to learn what? You know, when I, when I was in school, I learned that people are mean. As a kid, you know, I learned that other kids are mean. There's some bullies. I, I learned that I'm dumb. I learned that I wasn't, I wasn't capable, maybe as capable as some other people. And I also learned that I didn't like learning, at least not the way it was in that environment. But let me, let me uh, cut that story off about school later because I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to explain to you what the real truth about it is. Uh, but I've been thinking lately about uh, up upcoming man camp that's happening at our church and I want to encourage uh, the men to come to that and I was kind of thinking you know what stops us from participating in in those kinds of things as men and and, I, and, I, and as women as believers you know uh, and so I wanted to kind of share some things in encouragement but also it sort of expanded beyond that um, and I'll just say that uh, I actually can't be there for all of it this time. Uh, my daughter's graduating from college and, uh, and I'm gonna be traveling for that and then I'm actually driving back from college uh, with her. So I do plan to come by, but I, I won't be there for the whole thing formally. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed my food last year, but uh, you're gonna be much better off this year. So, um, but with that said, you know, that's an example there. I see three different types of reasons why um, men may not participate or you know this is about man camp but it could be you know reasons why women might not participate in in different events or activities or opportunities and one of them is a schedule conflict real reason I just gave you one that's a real reason for me uh, aside from you know obviously we're just all really busy especially now uh, in the planting season here irrigation water is on and Everybody's busy and it's beautiful. I love this time of year. Lots and lots of uh, friends in farming and, and uh, I, I struggle to be honest with everything I have going on. I, I gave myself a little window of time to, to, to study this and prepare for it and to think through what I would say on, on a video like this. All the while thinking, <clears throat> I don't really have time for this. Um, I shouldn't be doing this. I have a lot more other stuff I, I should be working on. Uh, between our own operation and, and uh, you know, campaign and uh, just life and my own responsibilities. But I'm, I'm doing it. So, uh, so that's excuse number one, number, number two. Number one is, you know, schedule conflict. Number two is oh, I'm just busy. I'm going to be busy. I don't want to participate in something like that. The one that's more common, I think, is more insidious, and I think it'll hit home for you as it does for me, is just not feeling like the investment is worth it. Like, oh, I can get by. You know, I can do with do it without that. And that is the reason why I wanted to bring this, uh, because I feel like that really is um, a common reason for us where we just are are going through our daily lives and we're devaluing the things that are really should be at their highest value. Meanwhile, you know, we're we're just we're punching the time clock on the things that, you know, maybe <clears throat> aren't or shouldn't be quite as important as they as they manifest themselves in our lives and so those are the three reasons why we avoid those kinds of things um, and I want to say that uh, Rick Motice gave me this book uh, it's called The Pursuit of God by uh, A.W. Tozer and, and this is a very small little book I'd highly recommend reading it I actually read this book I don't even know how many years ago, but it was at least two decades, maybe more. I, don't, I didn't even check to see when the copyright is on it, but it was a long time ago when I first read it, and it was really good back then. Um, 
the copyright on this version is 2020, but I know there was a pre previous printing of this at some point, obviously. I don't think, yeah. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so there was this one section in it that as I was reading through it, it's all really good, but a lot of it really just kind of hit me and I wanted to share some thoughts from that here. So I'm gonna run through some of that and then I'm gonna jump back to my notes and kind of go back to my, my school story um, and, and wrap it up. So give me a few minutes here to do this. And um, I'm gonna say that this is from chapter four. I'm gonna start, the title is Apprehending God, but I'm gonna start on page 40. And I'm not going to read all this. I'm going to read some sections for you just because I feel like it's important enough to actually hear his words. Uh, and then I'll kind of commentate a little bit. Uh, but uh, and, and rather than explaining what it is, I'm just going to take you right into it. Um, <clears throat> the Bible assumes as a self-evident fact that men can know God with at least the same degree of immediacy as they know any other person or thing that comes within the field of their experience. In other words, God has given us the ability to see, to feel, to taste, to touch God, just as much as he's given us the, the ability to use our senses to experience any other realities of our, our existence. And, and I think, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I think the evidence of our senses that we have physically in relation to how we experience life physically is proof of that. He's given us the same abilities on, on the spiritual side, which is what we're going to get at here. Um, we apprehend the physical world by experiencing the faculties given to us for that purpose. And we possess spiritual faculties by means of which we can know God and the spiritual world if we will obey the Spirit's urge and begin to use them. So, you know, if you decide to go through your day with earplugs in you're like oh, I'm not gonna listen to anything you're you're refusing to give you're refusing to re re use some senses that God has given us right um, so what, what he's saying there is that he's also given us senses in the spiritual realm to be able to live our lives by and those senses are kinda rusty for a lot of Christians this this chapter this book is absolutely written for the Christian just to be clear this is written for people who go to church and this is not a well I guess it is a rebuke the book really the message is a rebuke but I don't think it's meant to be confrontational it's meant to be loving like hey we're missing out on something here we might have gotten to this place where we have been lulled into living the world's way instead of living the way God designed us and that's what I think he's trying to get at here so um, the next section here it uses uh, the term chronic unbelief, uh, and he's talking about he's talking about believers actually, where where we've been habitualized into this nature of chronic unbelief, where we say one thing but we do another, and he says that faith enables our spiritual sense to function, where faith is defective. The result will be an inward insensibility and numbness towards spiritual things. In other words, we're kind of, we're disconnected, we're out of touch, we're not sensitive to the things of the Spirit. This is a condition of vast numbers of Christians today. No proof is necessary to support this statement, he says. We have but to converse with the first Christian we meet or enter the first church we find open to acquire all the proof we need. That is absolutely a rebuke if there ever was one on the, Amer you know, on the modern day Christian church. I, I really wish I knew which, what year this was actually first written because um, it would be interesting to know, to look back. I should have looked it up. I apologize uh, before I did this, but, um, but yeah, let me read that again. No proof is necessary to support this statement. The statement is that there's, there's this, uh, where faith is defective, the result will be an inward insensibility and numbness towards spiritual things. Uh, and that condition is a, a vast numbers of Christians today. No proof is necessary to support that statement. We have but no, we have we have but to converse with the first Christian. In other words, we just talk to the first Christian we meet or enter a church and we see all the proof we need to know that that statement is true. 
A spiritual kingdom lies all about us, enclosing us, embracing us, all together within our reach for our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God himself is here, waiting for our response to his presence. This eternal world will come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon his reality. That's powerful right there. This eternal world will come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. And then he spends the next almost two pages talking about defining the word reckon and the word reality. And we'll start with the word reality. I'm going to summarize these for you so we don't read all, but it is really good. Um, what is the term reality? What does it really mean? What does it stand for? What is reality? What is real? That's why I titled this video, What is Real? That's why I started with What is Real? And it's quite in interesting to think about what is real. What is real is not contingent on the observer. So I don't have to observe it for it to be real. It is real in and of itself. And that's, that's the next thing, is something that is real in and of itself. It exists in and of itself. And, and he goes on to define this even more. But this is the one that hit me the most. Reality is something that doesn't require the imagination. And, and that'll make more sense as we, as we get into some of the other comments that he says here. But he says that, uh, that idealists are, and, and, and he's speaking to unbelievers here, um, which, which he also terms absolutist, which is quite interesting. But he says that idealists will spin endless proofs that nothing is real outside of the mind. And, uh, they're, and they, they will espouse that there is no fixed points in the universe from which we can measure anything, which we know to be untrue. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that is there was, there was actually a, a mentor of mine uh, politically kind of gave me some insight into this uh, because he asked, me, he asked me to answer a question which I failed miserably at, and then he corrected me. Um, and he, he, the question, if I remember right, was basically like, what is the, what, uh, what is the framework around America, America's foundation, and, and our understanding of it? And what he was looking for was the framers of this country are the same as Christians. They were believers in God. We have a solid foundation. We have a... We have a junction point. We have a center point. We have a fixed point with which we can, everything else revolves around. And, and unbelievers don't have that. And, and what Tozer talks about here is that he, he, he basically synonymizes idealists with absolutists. So a lot of these people think that they're absolutist, and, uh, but, they're, but they're not. Um, and what we believe and what we know as Christians is that there is but one absolute, and that absolute is God. And Tozer even says in here, there is only one who is absolute, and that is God. That is our anchor. That is our center point. If you think about our judicial system, it, the entire system revolves around an absolute truth. And it also revolves around historical precedents that... Uh, that essentially helps to produce the results that we need in the future. So it's, it's uh, an absolute truth and then historical decisions, precedents, that is built on that absolute truth that the judges can look to and say, based on the absolute truth and historical decisions that have been made, I'm going to rule in this case on that in this particular way. And when they don't use absolute truth and they don't use past uh, prejudice or pra past judgment, if they don't reference that, then they're like a ship in the sea without an anchor. They're just kind of drifting around and they're going to make decisions on whatever feels good to them, whatever feels right to them. And, and that's exactly where the unbelievers fall today because they don't have that same anchor that we have. And, and that's, what, that's what, uh, what Tozer is getting at here. And so I want to continue on with this. I'm going to jump over to page 42, and I'm going to say this. So, um, again, it's talking about, we're wrapping up this whole idea, this argument, 
of what is real versus what is reckoned on. Which is, this is really good. Oh my goodness. Um, the sincere, plain man knows that the world is real. He finds it here when he wakes to consciousness and he knows that he did not think it into being. It was here waiting for him when he came and he knows that when he prepares to leave this earthly scene, it will be here still to bid him goodbye as he departs. By the deep wisdom of life, he is wiser than a thousand men who doubt. He stands upon the earth and feels the wind and the rain in his face and he knows that they are real. He sees the sun and the day <clears throat> by day and the stars by night. He sees the hot lightning play out uh, of the dark thundercloud. He hears the sounds of, the, of nature and the cries of human joy and pain. These he knows are real. He lies down on the cool earth at night and he has no fear that it will prove illusory or fail him while he sleeps. In the morning, the firm ground will be under him, the blue sky above him, and the rocks and trees around him, as when he closed his eyes the night before. So he lives and rejoices in a world of reality. With his five senses, he engages this real world. All things necessary to this physical existence, he apprehends by the faculties with which he has been equipped by God, who created him and placed him in such a world as this. Think about our five senses. Why, why do we have them? We have them in order to be able to experience this world that God has given us. Now, if God has given us this world and he's created us and he created these five senses that we know of for us to be able to interact with this world, that is our connection. That is our individual connection for us to be able to understand reality. And what Tozer is saying here is that we have those same senses, if you will, in the spiritual realm, spiritual realm, which allow us to interact with and to know who God is and to experience God. And there's a real key to this um, in terms of sort of this now, not yet uh, conversation we'll talk about in a minute. So let me continue. Now, by our definition, also God is real. He is real in the absolute and final sense that nothing else is. All other reality is contingent upon his. The great reality is God who is the author of the lower and dependent reality which makes up the sum of created things, including, including ourselves. God has an objective existence independent of and apart from any notions which we may have concerning him. In other words, we can't change God by thinking about him or not thinking about him or thinking bad about him or thinking good about him. We're not gonna have any impact on God's existence. The worshiping heart does not create its object. It finds him here when it awakes, when it wakes from its mortal slumber in the morning of its regeneration. Now, that sums up the discussion about what is real. Now he gets into this concept of wrecking, reckoning, or the word reckon. And I find this to be amazing. And I'm just going to read his words to you because it's impactful. So he starts with another word that we must clear up is the word reckon. Does this not mean the visualizing or imagining? Imagination is not faith. There are two, there are not only two there the two are not only different from but stand in sharp opposition to each other. Imagination projects unreal images out of the mind and seeks to attach reality to them. Faith creates nothing. It simply reckons upon that which is already there. Let me just read that again. Faith creates nothing. It simply reckons upon that which is already there. God and the spiritual world are real. We can reckon upon them with as much assurance as we reckon upon the familiar world around us. Our trouble isn't that we have established bad thought habits. We have a, our trouble is that we have established bad thought habits. I read that wrong. So our trouble is that we have established bad thought habits. We habitually think of this visible world as real and doubt the re reality of any other. 
We do not deny the existence of the spiritual world, but we doubt that it is real in the accepted meaning of the word. So this is really interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, give you an example on this next part that I think will really help you. I know it helps me. So the world of sense intrudes upon our attention day and night for the whole of our lifetime. It is a clamorous, insistent, and self-demonstrating. It does not appeal to our faith. It is here, assaulting our five senses, demanding to be accepted as real and final. But sin has no clouded, sin has so clouded the lens of our hearts that we cannot see the other reality, the city of God shining upon, shining around us. The world of sense triumphs, in other words, our senses. The visible becomes the enemy of the invisible, the temporal, the eternal. This is the curse inherited by every member of Adam's tragic race. So uh, it says here, the, and then I'm going to I want to give you an example here. It says, at the root of the Christian life lies belief in the invisible. The object of Christian's faith is un, is the unseen reality. And let me just say this: when I when I was thinking about putting this together, and I was I was trying to think about this, I realized. In the midst of this, what do we do when we pray? Because I've always thought, you know, I was just to, just to make fun of us, me included, you know, especially when we're in small groups, you know, we get together and we talk about, well, let's pray. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to pray about. And so then we go around and everybody says what they need prayer for. And then we do what? You know, sometimes we will grab hands, but we, we almost always will bow our heads. Maybe we'll remove our hat. And we close our eyes, right? We close our eyes. Why, why do we close our eyes? Why, why do we close our eyes? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, it seems like this reverent thing to do. You know, we bow our head, which is submission. You know, maybe we hold hands if we're, we're with family or friends or whatever. That's a connection. We're, we're part of something bigger than ourselves. But, but it really got me. You know, it's like, why do we close our eyes? We close our eyes because... We're distracted. Exactly what he says right in here. He says we're, what has he said? That um, the world of senses intrudes upon our attention day and night. If you, if you have your eyes open, your senses are being intruded upon. And it's hard to see beyond what you see. But what we don't realize is how much we imagine in the midst of what we see. We see things like you do this all the time when you're driving. You like you don't see what you actually see because you fill in half of it. It's amazing. And we do that all the time with our eyes. And he's saying right here that imagination is the opposite of faith. And so um, now I've ruined your prayer life because you're, <laughs> you're going to be thinking about all these details. Like, should I close my eyes? Should I, should I not smell things? Do I need to put earplugs in? Do I, you know? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, why do we close our eyes when we pray? You know why we close our eyes when we pray. Okay, I'm going to read just a little bit more of this section. Um, actually, I'm going to jump to uh, this last little section that I want to read, and then I'm going to go back to my notes here real quick, and we'll wrap this up. But um, God bless you. So uh, we must avoid the common fault of pushing the other world into the future. This is very, very important. Um, earlier I mentioned uh, we mentioned this other world when, or Tozer mentioned this other world I'm trying to remember where it was at but uh, he's saying that uh, the visible world basically fights against the other world and what he's encouraging us to do is to see the other world as reality when it's hard for us to do that because we have these five senses that's defining this world for us every single day. And so he's wanting us to put more emphasis on the other world and realize that the other world is just as real as this one. And in many cases, more so. And he says that God is triumphant and a reality above our own reality. So whatever reality, whatever is real, whatever we say is real, and I can touch this computer and I can breathe this air, whatever, all that stuff is a subjected reality. It's subversive reality to his reality. His reality is greater. Our reality doesn't impact his, his existence. Okay, so we must, but we must avoid the common fault of pushing the other world into the future. 
Remember I was talking about the now but not yet, so we'll get into that here. So it is not future but present. It parallels our familiar physical world and the doors between two worlds are open. So what he's saying is, is that we tend to think of our spiritual life as somewhere that we're going someday, eternity. And we don't think of eternity as something that has started in the past and we were born into eternity. We're, not, we're living through eternity right now, but we don't think of it that way and we don't necessarily speak of it that, in, those, in those terms. We think of it as like we're living in this world and then we're going to move to eternity later instead of the two moving forward together. Uh, let's see. So, so it parallels. The, the other world parallels our familiar physical world. And the doors between the two worlds are open so we can walk between the two of them. We can walk into our spiritual life that is happening, eternity is going on right now. And, and our, uh, it's kind of like when you're going down the highway and there's a state route that is the same as an uh, interstate highway and you're on both of them at the same time. That's kind of the, ten, the analogy between these two here. So, Ye are come, says the writer of Hebrews unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable companies of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge to all, and to the spirits of men made perfect, and to, the Je and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of sprinkling, uh, that sprink sprinkleth better things than that of Abel. All these things are contrasted with the mount that might be touched, the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words that might be heard. May we not safely conclude that as the realities of Mount Sinai were apprehended by the senses, so the realities of Mount Zion were, are also to be grasped by the soul. And this not by any trick of the imagination. Remember, imagination stands in opposition to faith, uh, but in downright actuality. The soul has eyes with which to see and ears with which to hear. Feebly they may be from long disuse, but by the life-giving touch of Christ, alive now and capable of the sharpest sight and most sensitive hearing. Amazing. This is uh, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. So let me just go back to my notes here. So having heard the term, so I'm going to question, uh, I asked you this a minute ago, but have you heard the term now and not yet? It really kinds, ties into what he was just talking about, about Mount Sinai versus Mount Zion and the now and not yet. And so it's, again, those parallel tracks. Our eternity has already begun. We're in the midst of eternity. So we don't have to look forward to our spiritual world or to our eternal life. We also don't have to look forward to enjoying the experiences of an eternal life and and I want to talk about that in a minute here because I think it's very important I think Tozer is speaking of our prosperity to or our propensity to make our faith about the not yet or the yet not yet or yet to come instead of the now we are living in eternity now uh, what brings us greatest joy do we need any of the physical senses to enjoy that feeling and uh, yeah, so let me jump into that in just a second. I'll, uh, I'll give you the answer to that, at least from my perspective, what, what gives us, what brings us our greatest joy. Do you have thoughts on that? Do you have ideas of what you feel like brings you your greatest joy? Um, I know that as I go on throughout life, I know that the various amenities, so to speak, of my life are, uh, my sister and I are both in our 50s, and we had a conversation about this of, not too long ago, it was a few years ago, but we were talking about what's really, what really matters, you know, to our daily existence. Like we're young and we want all these things, you know, and, and then we get to it and we're like, yeah, you know, just some basic things like, you know, like a really comfortable shower. Like we just love our shower or something, or like a, a, a kitchen that's made for just making great food or something, you know, just like little things that like, these are the things that are really important, you know, and like, obviously our family and, and our ability to communicate and like it's kind of cool now you know versus in past days when um you know we didn't have the technology we have now we can kind of keep in track keep keep in touch with our family even though they're grown and doing their own thing it's you can still keep in touch with your kids and you can even see them on video and stuff like that um 
you know, my mom lives with us, as, as many of you know, and so being able to experience life with her, you know. So what, what are the things that are really important? But there's something that's even bigger than all that, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so I think our mature feelings could be a part of our spiritual senses. So um, this is like... There's a book that Nikki and I actually read and were taught. This was, gosh, like 15 years ago we started this process, but it's a book called How We Love uh, and some great authors, um, the Yurkoviches, Mylon K. Yurkovich. And if, if you have heard maybe 25, 30 years ago, there was a book called uh, The Five Love, Love Languages by uh, Gary Chapman. And it was a great book very easy to understand. You could read the book in a couple hours and you could literally digest it. You understand it, you're good. There's these five love languages and they really do apply to people and they make a lot of sense and they helped us a lot. Um, the five love languages by uh, the Yurkovich is, is like, okay, if, if uh, the, the five love languages was 2D, then the, the five love styles, sorry, love styles, um, the book's called How We Love, and they talk about this thing called love styles. So if, if love languages is 2D, very simple to understand, love languages is like, or love styles is like 3D. It's very difficult. It took us two or three years to actually get our arms around it to where we sort of understood it. Um, and I would say it's, that's the same thing with this. You know, I didn't even think about this before, but our, rea our experience of Christianity is you know, do, going through the motions of the Christian disciplines and going to church and doing all the right stuff. It's very much like Chapman's book on love languages. We can read it in a couple hours. We can understand it. We can be a part of the team and we can go through the emotions and doing all the right stuff. But we're kind of missing the other world that Tozer is talking about. And in order to understand the other world, it takes years of, of consistent, steady investment of, you know, those Christian disciplines and, and seeing it and, and closing off your senses, closing your eyes and shutting yourself down to some of the habits and propensities of this world and the ways that we're drawn through those senses and opening ourselves up to what God has for us and what this other world has for us, according to what Tozer is saying. And so that's why I say, I think our mature feelings, our understanding to even know and articulate our own feelings, right? This is all part of the the Yurkovich's work through their, their love styles and their How We Love book, but getting to know what your feelings are, being able to identify them for yourself and then being able to express those to your spouse is incredibly important. Um, and so uh, I think as you see and feel your mature feelings, those could actually be a tool that's used in the other world. And that's my, my point with that. Okay. So let's go back to my experiences when I was in school. Remember I was talking to you about how I felt dumb and I felt like school was a place where um, you learn that kids hate people because there's bullies and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, here's the thing that is the reality of that. Um, it can be those things and it can be those hurtful things and it can be difficult, but school can also be the tool that helps us to learn how we learn. What if it never was about all of the things that were in the books and the the basic steps that we were supposed to go to but what if it was actually about each of us individually learning how we learn and being able to get enough practice to be able to go through the steps of being able to see how we learn um, and when I when I realized that that it was about how we learn my perspective on school completely changes even as I look back on the experiences that I had and I realized that I had some hard times but I, I now look at those through a different lens now that's amazing now to me that's like one of the examples of the other world where you can look back on your life and you can see that you've gone through difficult things but now you can see those things through a different lens that allows you to not be hurt continuously day by day as a result of those things that happened in that in the past and that's what I'm talking about here so it's like it's like we take off a pair of colored glasses and we see our past experiences different. We see them from the other world perspective. And it's the same for our faith. Um, we can see it by day by day as, as a personal or private thing that, and that you know, we hope is true, or we can, we, we can keep working hard to do our best so that we earn all the benefits of being good. We know that, we're taught that every single day. That's, a, that's the ritual of our church experience, our life experience as American Christians. 
or we can see our faith as what it is. It is something that we gain strength in as we exercise it, but it is also based on a reality rather than our imagination. There's none of this stuff. None of our faith is based on our imagination. It's all based on a reality that God is true. God is that center point. God is our anchor. So um, those that refuse to believe in God live in a fantasy world. That's the truth. And the only connection that they have are those five senses. And those are the only anchors that they have. And the truth is there's, there's no cosmic anchor. There's no eternal anchor. There's no worldly anchor. There's no anchor, period. All they have is their five senses and, they, and the ways in which they experience their life through those senses. And I feel bad for those people. That should be a compelling reason why we would want to help them to see and understand our faith in God. But we must understand our relationship with God first. And we must be anchored ourselves. And we must be experiencing that free joy that comes from a relationship with God that isn't yoked in this American uh, sort of recognition of this of the world that we live in as if it's idealistic or as if it's as if it is absolute it's not absolute the only thing that's absolute is god and if we're going to say that we have to include the other world and our our physical world those have to be married together and we have to be pressing down that path together um so let me just go practical on this because it's kind of like at the end of something like so you say well so what what do i do what do i do differently you're just telling me to believe in something that um that we all know exists, that we say exists, that we want to believe exists, um, but we sell ourselves out regularly and we don't know how to stop, okay? Let me just give you an example of this and I'll tell you what I think we should do as first steps. I was in a, um, a men's uh, Bible study meeting, this was years ago, and one of the younger associate pastors, very candid guy, awesome dude, loves, loves the Lord, um, the the older not old but kind of middle-aged pastor was speaking and it was it was a men's group there was probably 20 or 25 of us or something and um and he said you know if we really believed in god these are the things that we would be doing and he kind of like went off and he kind of talked about some examples of like well you know i would do this or whatever and you know if i but the whole crux of it was if i believed and this younger associate said yeah, I mean, my life would be totally different if I actually believed in God. And the pastor was like, oh my gosh, this is like a, an associate pastor who just said he doesn't believe in God. And he, was, he was being real. He's saying, I see these things that you're describing in my own life. You see, what we do in those settings is we listen to those things and then we're like, yeah, we would never do that. We're somehow above that. It's like, no, we're not. We do all the same stuff. We have the same doubts, the same fears, the same hesitations, the same bad habits, all the same things that lead us down these paths to unrighteousness. They trick us into believing in something that isn't even real instead of really grasping what is real and, and allowing this other world to come into alignment with, or it should be the other way around, allowing the world that we see through our senses to come in alignment with the with the, the other world, as Tozer calls it, and to, to see ourselves live that out on a daily basis. And so it was just funny. And I actually have a lot of respect for that guy, um, still friends to this day, uh, because he had the guts to say that, to say like, yeah, my life would be totally different if I, if I actually believed, you know? And he's, he's like, yeah, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be overweight. I, I would be in, you know, I'd be doing way better in my business. And, you know, I. I wouldn't get upset about this and that and my wife and I would have a way better marriage and my kids would have a better dad and there's all kinds of things I would do different if if I actually believed and that's basically what he said and he kind of gave some examples and the at first the pastor's reaction was to try to back him out of it try to put it in reverse and back him out of that comment and he's like no I'm this is real and and then he kind of went with it a little bit hesitantly but then everybody else came alive it was like oh my gosh I know what this guy is talking about because I struggle with the same the same things to some degree and I think we all do and so okay so what can we do how does this hit practically for us this is my be my belief is that our faith is based in the gospel story and we just went through Easter and and obviously that's a, a big part of that because that's that's the start of it that is the beginning well there's something before that but obviously um, creation happened before that, but um, but every element of this is true. It's vital. It's real, and it does not require imagination. 
And this is the gospel story. And to me, this is the crux of our Christian faith. And if you don't understand this or you don't know it, then I would watch some Mark Driscoll. I would read, um, you know, uh, there's some di different things I could recommend, but um, R.C. Sproul is amazing. Um, but, but Mark Driscoll is one of the best teachers in terms of, that I know of, in terms of somebody who really teaches this. Um, if you have youth, I would strongly recommend they get involved in Dare to Share, Greg Steer's organization, because they really help students understand, first understand how to define what the gospel is, and then, all, then that, through that comes our outpouring of our faith, and then, then physically going out and being able to learn how to share it with other people. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? And I'll just tell you, this is my experience of it. This is my knowledge of it based on all the years I've been studying and the thing that compels me to continue in my Christian faith. And if it wasn't for this, I would just be a normal pew sitter just like everybody else if I was even bothering to go to church at all. God created us. He created us with a mission and a vision. We rebelled. That's where sin comes in, which I call false idol worship. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we didn't have any way to re -reconcil to reconcile ourselves back from God or back to God because our rebellion created a separation or created a gap between us and God. We had no way of closing that gap or bridging that gap or jumping across that gap or driving you know something nothing. We have no way. We have no transport. Uh, and so God sent Himself in the form of a Son named Jesus, part of the Trinity to be our what's called propitiation, but basically to make the payment to, to close that gap, to bring us back into reconciliation with God so that we're back, in, we're back one with God. Jesus, at, under our understanding, is the Son of God. Jesus is the heir to the throne of God. We, he adopts us, God adopts us as sons and daughters to be basically brothers and sisters with Jesus. This is so cosmically wild. And we get to be part of Jesus' uh, redemption. We, he, he redeems us and draws us back to God. I mean, it's just amazing that we get to be part of the family of God through the work that Jesus did on the cross. And here's the key. It was nothing that we did. In fact, all this happened before we, any of us were ever born. So we're born into our false idol worship, our sin, but we're also born into our salvation and all we have, to, our job, our job is to simply live in the other world. Our job is to turn our hearts towards God, to accept him, to confess him, to live for him, and to, uh, to then live in this other world while we also live for a time in this, in this reality that we, we uh, enjoy with our senses. And so, <clears throat> again, the gospel is very simple. God created us. He had a mission and vision for us. We rebelled. That created a separation, a brokenness, a gap between us and God. Jesus, or God came in the form of a man named Jesus. He's part of the Trinity, God, uh, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus paid the price for us by dying on the cross. He rose again three days later, and we received that redemptive life as a result. And the thing that compels us and that ties to this is what motivates us? What motivates us? What motivates us is the reality of knowing that it's not of our own doing. It's the, it's the reality. If you sit back in your chair and you think about this, this is the thing that brings us our greatest joy and our greatest hope. It's knowing that Jesus did what he did for us to reconcile us back to our creator with absolutely no work of our own. In fact, he did it in the middle and in the midst and before we ever even committed cosmic sin for us personally because we were born after this all happened we chose our false idols throughout our lives we have worshiped those false idols throughout our lives we still worship those false idols in some cases in different areas of our lives and jesus redemption still applies to us and if that doesn't compel you to want to serve god not feel like you have to serve god then nothing will it's the idea of that reality of that redemptive pri payment that Jesus paid in the midst of us being a total turd and he did it anyways and he loves us anyways and he gives us that opportunity anyways and that right there is the compelling thing that draws us to God and wants to not cause us to do good but we want to serve God in a way that exemplifies and expresses our gratitude and our gratefulness towards what God has done for us. And that, my friends, I believe is the way that we walk into this. This is how we take the step 
of being able to become more otherworldly instead of worldly, where we start to see God as more real or, or more preeminent than the world that we actually live in for a time while we have these physical sense, senses and this physical experience. So um, God bless you, my friends. Um, and for those who I don't know, God bless you. Uh, God is, 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 uh, is a great God. And every day you see humanity around you uh, doing their thing, uh, give thanks to God because he created all of us in all of this. And as you enjoy the glorious views of the spring planting, the seasons, um, I, I, I hope that you choose to see the realities that are before us thanks to our creator rather than the things of our imagination. God bless you.